Hi and welcome to this lecture on the integumentary system. In this lecture I am going to focus on the parts of the integumentary system and more specifically the epidermis. I will save the dermis and the hypodermis for other lectures. Well, let's get started with the first one. The integumentary system, it consists of the skin and its derivatives. Some of its derivatives include the nails, hair, sweat glands, and the sebaceous glands, otherwise called the oil glands. Now, the integument is the skin covering the body. We also call it the cutaneous membrane. It is a barrier to the outside world. It is that which separates the external from the internal environment. We often use it as a visual indicator of our physiology and health. And if you've ever heard of dermatology, it is the scientific study and treatment of the integumentary system. It accounts for approximately 50% of all health care. Here is a figure showing the skin. And you can see that there is a lot to know about the skin. Let's just take a look at some of these. Here we have the general term, the integument, which consists of the epidermis and the dermis. Notice that it does not include, does not include, the subcutaneous layer that is separate from the integument. Now, we are going to focus on the epidermis in this lecture and then later focus on the dermis in others. The dermis is made up of the papillary layer, which is the top layer, and the reticular layer, which is the bottom layer. Now, in these layers, we can see a lot of structures. We can see those things such as a hair follicle, that is the tube that houses the hair, the hair itself. We see sensory receptors here. Those are things that allow us to have touch. We see them here and here as well. There are many different kinds within the skin. We can see the epidermal ridge, which is here, also called the dermal papilla, that you see here. The dermal papilla is the papillary layer, and the epidermal ridge is the stratum basale structure. Associated with the hair, we can find the erector pili muscle, which is a muscle that serves no real function in humans. We see the oil gland that is associated with the hair. We can also see a sweat gland and the duct that leads to the surface of the skin. We can also see the arteries and veins that is laying within the hypodermis and then coming towards the dermis and the epidermis. But please notice that there is no artery or vein within the epidermis itself. The epidermis is avascular. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide and learn about some of the parts. Now, with the integument or the skin, we have the epidermis, that is the top layer, as you've seen in the slide before. You have five layers within the epidermis. The stratum basale, spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and corneum. Here's a term that I have my, my students learn, or an acronym rather, or saying. It is big, stinky, gorillas, like, corn. That's a nice easy little saying so that you can learn it from deep to superficial. Now the first three layers are with living keratinocytes. That's from here to there. Those are living. And the last two are with dead keratinocytes. 
and we're going to learn what keratinocytes are here in just a minute. Here's a picture showing the different layers and you can see that here is our dermis and then starts the epidermis with the basale, the spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and corneum. This is an artist representation and this is an actual picture of skin. Now, within that you can see some other things as well that I have not mentioned such as the keratinocytes, the melanocytes, dendritic cells, and tactile cells and we will get into what each of those do here in just a little bit. The first layer is the stratum basale. It is the deepest epidermal layer. It can also be called the stratum germinativum. You may see that in some books as well. It is a single layer of cuboidal to low columnar cells. It is attached to the basement membrane. That is the membrane that connects the epidermis with the dermis. And it is occupied by three main cell types. You have the keratinocytes, melanocytes, and tactile cells. Looking at the keratinocytes, they are by far the most abundant cells in the epidermis. It is found in all layers. And in this basale, you see a lot of stem cells. These stem cells are able to divide and then regenerate into new cells. So as you lose cells at the surface of the skin, you can replace those cells with new ones at the stratum basale, and then they will work their way towards the stratum corneum. Their name comes from the synthesis of a protein called keratin, and this protein strengthens the epidermis. It is a tough protein. It is a little bit elastic. Second cell that I want to look at is the melanocytes. The melanocytes are scattered among the keratinocytes, though they are not nearly as many. They produce and store the pigment melanin, and this is the pigment that gives skin color or helps to give your skin color. There are other pigments as well. They are going to make these granules called melanosomes and then they transfer those into keratinocytes. And these melanosomes will then accumulate in the keratinocytes and then it shields the keratinocytes DNA from ultraviolet radiation such as from the skin. And that is what gives us things such as suntans third kind is the tactile cells. These are also called Merkel cells. They are relatively few in number, but they give us a sensitivity to touch. So when they are compressed, if something is pushing against your skin, they will release chemicals that stimulate sensory nerve endings. And these sensory nerve endings then transmit that impulse to the brain so that your brain knows that you were touched in that spot. Second layer is the stratum spinosum. Now it is several layers thick whereas the stratum basale is mainly just one layer, sometimes two. It is also known as the spiny layer because of the way it appears in the microscope. The cells that were made in the stratum basale are being pushed into this layer and as they are being pushed into this layer they begin to develop into specialized non-dividing keratinocytes and these keratinocytes are going to start making a lot of keratin. Now these keratinocytes are attached by structures called intercellular junctions, specifically desmosomes, which is a kind of intercellular junction. And these desmosomes, they will literally attach one cell to the next. Now in the spinosum you have the dendritic cells, also called Langerhorn cells, and they are immune cells that will help initiate the immune response. So if there is a pathogen within the epidermis, these cells are the cells that will detect that pathogen and then tell the immune system that they need to get rid of it. Keep in mind also that they will respond to epidermal cancer cells. In the stratum granulosum, you have three to five layers of keratinocytes. It is also called the granular layer. It is above the stratum spinosum, it is superficial to it, and it is the first layer of keratinization. And that is where the keratinocytes are going to fill themselves with keratin. 
And as they do, the problem is that the keratin causes the nucleus and organelles to disintegrate. And the fully keratinized cell is dead, but still structurally sound, so it doesn't break apart. However, the process is not complete until you get in the layers above it, the lucidum and corneum. Now, the stratum lucidum is two to three layers of keratinocytes. It is translucent, also known as the clear layer. It is above or superficial to the stratum granulosum. And it is found only on the thick skin, which is the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. It is also filled with that translucent protein, elodeon. Elodeon is a intermediate in the keratin maturation. Finally, we have the stratum corneum. Notice how many cell layers thick it is. It is 20 to 30 layers of dead interlocking keratinose cells. Remember those desmosomes that I mentioned before, that is what's locking them together. They are anucleate and, t and very tightly packed. The plasma membrane is still there, but it's enclosing all the keratin that was added in the layers before it. You may also see it called the horn-like layer. It is the most superficial layer of the epidermis. It is that which you see on people. And the surface is very unsuitable for the growth of many microorganisms. And that's because of the exocrine glands, such as these sweat glands. It'll create something called the acid mantle. As you look at the stratum corneum, there is a migration of keratinocytes through it. It originates from the stem cells in the stratum basale, and each of those new keratinocytes will migrate through each layer to the stratum cornea over the period of approximately two weeks. And as they migrate to this top, they are undergoing those structural changes where they add the keratin and the nucleus and organelles die. Then they will remain in the stratum corneum for another two weeks, for a total of four weeks, before they are shed from the body. Here is the picture showing those layers. Keep in mind that the stratum basale is where you have the stem cells, and these are the cells that are going to divide into the keratinocytes, and the keratinocytes are going to move this direction up through the various layers until you get to the top and as it moves up they are going to become keratinized and lose their nucleus and organelles so that at this spot you have keratinized stratified squamous cells that are completely dead they are interlocking and they help create that barrier that is your skin now in the other figure we can see the dendritic cell which is the example of the white blood cell for the immune system. The melanocytes, these are the cells that will produce melanin and put those melanosomes into the keratinocytes around them so that they can have the melanin protection as well. And then we have the tactile cell, which is that cell that releases the chemical to the sensory nerve ending, telling it that something had touched the skin in that spot. Now there is some variation within the epidermis. People don't often realize that the epidermis is not uniform. It changes from spot to spot within the body. And that goes for the skin as well. There is two different kinds. We have the thick skin versus the thin skin. Now the thick skin, as it sounds, has all five layers of the epidermal strata. We find it on the palms of the hands and soles of the feet as well as the surfaces of the fingers and toes. It does contain sweat glands, as I'm sure you can relate to if you are nervous and your hands sweat. However, it has no hair follicles or sebaceous glands. Often ranges from 0.4 to 0.6 millimeters thick. Contrast that with a thin skin where it is covering most of the body. However, it lacks the stratum lucidum, so it doesn't contain all the layers. And it has all three sweat glands, hair follicles, and the sebaceous glands. 
and it is generally from 0.075 to 0.15 millimeters thick which is very very thin. Here is two pictures of thick versus thin skin. These are actual pictures of the skin themselves taken with a microscope. We can see in the thick skin here is this stratum lucidum. However, you don't see that within the thin. We go from the spinosum to the granulosum and there's no lucidum in between. All right, thanks for watching. If this video has helped you, please like and subscribe to my channel.